Okay. Well, let me know when we're ready. Do I do I need to record it or should are you going to record it? I'm recording. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, and welcome to this week's graphics programming virtual meetup. Um, we're following the Berlin Code of Conduct. We have our Discord, you can type it in, or we'll ask one of us and we'll throw a link your way. I got a Twitter too, which you should follow, even though I don't know exactly how many posts we have on there. But so today we're going to be talking about the Tiny Renderer software rasterizer project, just lesson zero through two. We're fought, this is a project you can follow along online. There's the link to the actual text of the tutorial. I have a reference implementation uh, on GitHub that's more or less a collection of the actual text and put into a runnable form. Um, and that, that's what I'll be using for my code samples. If I'm not. Um, so lesson zero is really quite simple. It's the project setup. Uh, you create a project. Um, you, you copy in the tga image.h and, and .cpp file, you create a main.cpp file, you copy and paste this code in, and you set it up with your build system, how you set it up, it's your own, your own dealio. So the code in front of us, uh, can you see my mouse? Okay. Um, we're just gonna create some colors to use, even though I think I only use the red, but we create an image of 100 pixels by 100 pixels. This will create a memory buffer that the you that you can access using various commands like image.set. So it'll set pixel 52 by 41 to the to the color red. And it'll just set that pixel. Then we have to flip it vertically just because we're we want the coordinate frame to be from the bottom right corner, not the top right corner bottom right. I'm not sure how the camera will, if it'll flip it on me. But anyways, we want the from zero, we want zero, zero to be on the bottom, not the top. So it should look like this. Um, a red dot on a black background. Woo. And that that's quite literally everything for setup we're going to do. Um, so first thing we're actually going to cover is Bres Bresenham's line drawing algorithm, where we're going to try to draw a line from two points. But instead of being like, this is how you do it officially, we're going to start from a very simplistic approach. Just, okay, we have our two points, and we're just going to try to draw a line between them as simply as possible. So to do that, we're going to take, we're going to have a t value that increments from the start point to the end point. But I don't mean physical points. I mean from 0 to 1, because we have to know how far along we are. And so we have a for loop that will iterate from 0 to 1 going in 0 0.1 increments. So now that we have our going from the start to the end, but on a 0 to 1 scale, we can actually use that to linearly interpolate on the x and the y axis. So every step of the lay, uh, for every step of t, we're going to figure out how far along between the x0 and x1 and y0 and y1 values we should use. And so uh, I don't have a slide for it, but linear interpolation is is the is a function that will take a start and an end point and a t value between zero and one and then return a value between the start and the end point that's as far along as t is as long and we use that in quite a few places in this code base so we have our x and our y we in linearly interpolate and then every for every step t we draw at that pixel along it so well I don't know how well it will come across here because of what compression and whatnot, but you should notice that there's what well, the algorithm we just did has a bunch of dots. It's not a solid line like we want. And that's because we only took a hundred steps, but this image is like 500 pixels by 500 pixels. And we're trying to stretch it across 500 pixels. So it's going to have a lot of gaps and that doesn't look very good. So the way to improve this is to, instead of having a hundred discrete steps, we should have as many steps as we need to go across the image. So if we had a one dimensional image instead of 2D and we want to draw from, I don't know, coordinate four to coordinate seven, we would want to go four, five, six, seven. So we have four steps. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do that 
on the x-axis. We're going to say, okay, x0 to x1. We're going to increment on every pixel along the way. And then we'll just draw on that. Now, we still need to know how far on the y-axis we need to draw. So we're going to linearly interpolate on the y-axis. But we need to know how far along we are from 0 to 1. And we can do that by taking the current position along the x-axis minus it from the starting position and then divide that by the total range. And so that gives us a number between 0 and 1 indicating how far along between x0 and x1 we are. Then we use that, we linearly interpolate y on that, and then we set the pixel. And so if, we're, if we say had a x coordinate or an x0 coordinate of 10 and an x1 of 50, we'll take 40 steps, which means we'll draw 40 pixels. Well, as you can see here, it looks great if we're just going on the x, if the x-axis changes a lot, but the y-axis changes a little. But if we rotate that and we try to add a, uh, go very diff, very far on the y-axis, but not the x-axis, we have that same dot problem we had before. And that's because we're only looking at the x-axis. If we have 100 steps on the x or a, diff, a delta on the x-axis of 100, we'll take 100 steps. But if our delta is only 2, We'll take two steps. If our delta is literally zero, we'll take, I hope, one step, but I think it'll literally be zero steps. So a vertical, a vertical line would be, it, it, you wouldn't even draw. So, and then if you notice that the diagonal is completely jagged, where it's, it's going, it's doing like a stair step pattern, but instead of being a perfect 90 stair step, sometimes it's a little above, sometimes it's a little below. So we can fix that if we, try to account for the delta on both the, the the delta on both the y and x axis now if i was to write, if i was writing this from scratch without any future reference i would probably go and figure it out on a per pixel basis so i'd go okay do i need to go 5 pixels down and then i need to go 1 pixel across whatever um, and then i would try to go that but what the solution that the tutorial uses that I quite like is just flipping the axis that we walk on. So what we know is that we're going to do the attempt to would take every pixel step on the X axis. Well, if the Y axis changes less than the X axis, or if the delta of the Y axis is less than the X axis, that means you're taking more steps across than you are up. And that means that you will always draw on the y-axis whenever you draw on the x, you know what I'm saying? You'll never skip a pixel on the y-axis because the x-axis always changes more often, allowing you to draw those pixels. So the simple way I like that this thing does, that this tutorial does is it simply swaps the x and the y coordinates. So the x values become the y and the y becomes the x but only if the y delta is greater than the x delta. So the code here is simply doing an absolute, is simply doing, is figure, finding the deltas of the x and the y values. And then if the y value delta is greater, then it will swap the x and the y. x0 becomes y0, x1 becomes y1. And we set a Boolean value to true that we're steep, which means we're flipped. So we also want to make sure that when we're going left to right instead of right to left, left to right, coordinate systems are weird. Um, regardless, if this value is greater than we also want to swap on that, uh, we want to flip it. We don't want to rotate. Um, so now we pretty much do the exact same logic as attempt two, but instead of um, setting your image to the x, y, if we're steep, which means we've rotated, so the x is the y and the y is the x, we draw on the y, x to detranspose it. So that's a whole lot of work, but we get a nice, nice vertical and horizontal line. Unfortunately, our diagonal is still a little bit wonky. Um, so let's try to fix that. So another thing we can do is we, if you look at the code here, we do this linear, we, we figure out this t value and this y value, and we do a, quite a bit of calculation per, per step along the axis. 
some of the stuff can be pre-computed, like x, x1 minus x0. <laughs> so we can factor out some common, some common things. Um, so we have our delta x and our delta y. Those are just the x and the y values. Now, this is assuming that the x is the major axis and the y is the minor axis, where major being the larger delta. Um, I'm pretty sure that's not the right terminology in the sense that major and minor axis probably have a specific term, have specific meaning in other fields, but I'm using it here because it's easy to remember major versus minor. Anyways, so we have this delta area, delta error variable, which is the change in the y-axis divided by the change in the x-axis, which is quite literally the slope value. So um, for every pixel we go along the, uh, along the major axis, we will go d error steps vertically, or on the, it's the rise over run. Getting back to algebra one, which I took forever ago, and it's very fun to be rehashing that. So we have error here, which is another floating point variable, and this is our accumulator variable. So it starts at zero, and so uh, and then we have our oh, uh, another um, then we have our y variable, which is not an accumulator. It's more of just our current. Actually, it is accumulator, I guess, but it's accumulator of steps in one. Anyways, it's our current y axis. So we're going to have an a, a y place. We're going to have a for loop. If we go to the next slide, we can see it. We have an x, a for loop of x going to 0 to 1, or x 0 to x 1. And then we change it from interpolating uh, the y, the figuring out the how far along, we instead just increment through the range, and then um, through the range. What, am I, what do I mean? What do I mean? Instead of figuring out how far along the x and the y axis, uh, the x, the start and the stop, start and the end, of the x-axis is to figure out how far along we are on the y, we're just going to keep count of that manually. So every every tick along the x-axis, we're going to add the d error, or which is or there's just the slope. And whenever the error is above 0 0.5 or half the distance from 0 to 1, which would be uh, when we hit 1, that would indicate that we are on the next uh, place. Um, then we will change the y value to whatever we should have or add to the y value in whichever direction we want to go. So if the y, if the y0 is greater than y1, we're going to be de decrementing. So that, that's how we handle a negative direction there. And then we subtract one from the error. When I first saw this, I was kind of confused because I thought this should have been a one and this should be going back to zero. But we're, what we're instead doing is we're having a sliding window where we start from negative, we start from zero, go to negative, start, we start y at zero, the error at least, the accumulator I should say. We go to 0.5 and then we jump to the next y value and then we go back to, then our accumulator goes at, to zero point, negative 0 0.5 and then we increment a whole one unit and then go back. And the reason we do that is because the lines we're drawing we want each pixel, to the, we want the, the coordinate of the pixel, like the two by two, to be the center of the pixel, not the bottom right corner. Because if we're the bottom right corner, then if we have a slight amount less than that, we're actually gonna be drawing in a whole different pixel. And that's just, we shift everything by 0.5. Um, and it, it looks ugly, but it makes our nice diagonal line perfect because before we didn't have that um, accounting of the bottom right corner. So we're going to have one more attempt, and this one just is to remove the use of floating point. In the tutorial, he has some benchmarks of the code that, you know, try to make it faster. But I went, I don't want to benchmark code that I'm not going to use after this chapter because that's not I'm not going to try I'm not going to make this code a lot faster and I'm not going to use this code a lot because there are faster ways to do this entire thing even without um you know multi-threading and GPUs and all the fancy high performance stuff that we have today so this one the only really big change with attempt 5 versus 4 is shifting the 
frame of reference that we do the error accumulation. It's not really error. That's a terrible name because it's not really an error. It's just an accumulator of the subpixel amount we're changing on the minor axis. And then once we reach a threshold, which is in the pre in attempts four case was 0.5, we reset it to negative 0.5 and then let it increment again. Um, this time we're going to be doing it a bit differently. So we have our D error is going to be two times the delta Y, which is our entire range times two. So if we're going from 10 to 20, that's going to be 10 units. And then we're going to double that for 20. And then error itself is just going to be a singular integer value. So, um, Probably call those things like double D error and double error. The naming you use here is pretty yeah, confusing. I, I completely agree. And some of the logic is really like counterintuitive, it feels like. Because every, every tick, we're going to be adding to the error value by the ch total change in the y distance. I don't think I got the code wrong. Um, let me, I, I'm actually. Yeah, I guess Sorry. I was kind of tracking it with the floating point, but I'm not quite understanding with the integer stuff here. <laughs> That's also my thought. I, I feel like the, the code works, but the, the, the error two is greater than DX. I believe that's just because we factored out the DX. What, what my thought is, is we've scaled the entire problem so that everything lands on whole integers instead of fractional units of a floating point. That's all we've done. We've um, like, that, that's, that's just all that we need to do. Yeah, it, yeah, it is literally just changing the scale, but it's the, in the name of performance for some reason. And I just kind of went, cool, yeah, let me actually look at the algorithm rather than trying to optimize it. So I won't, I won't spend any much more time on this because it's kind of annoying. Instead, I'd rather do the interesting thing of wireframe rendering. So to set up wireframe rendering, you need to get the model.h, model.cpp, and geometry h uh, files into your project. Um, as I learned, the names of Vec3f were changed in geometry. So the geometry.h that I initially started with uses these Vec3f with a capital V. And then the one I needed that the that is in the actual like math in the master branch or in the in the tip of master instead of some previous version. It changed it to lowercase and dropped the F completely and changed it to double. And I was like, well, okay, so we're going to use doubles now. Uh, anyways, this is a model loader class. You give it a path to a file. If you are unfamiliar with the object um, wavefront OBJ format, understand that it's a text file with a bunch of vertex positions and a bunch of description of the faces where it'll say, okay, this vertex is made, uh, I have one for, this triangle is made up of vertex two, three, and four. This triangle is made up of vertex two, four, and five. And it's a text file, so you can actually read it and you can edit all the numbers if you really wanted to. But anyways, it's a very simple format. Uh, you could write your own loader for it. I just went with the one the project uses because this project is about software rasterization, not model loading. Um, again, we have to have our TGA image to draw into. Then after we've loaded our model, we go through every face in it. And because there's three triangles, there's three vertices in a triangle, we'll go through each vertex. And be, yeah. And we're doing that because we're not drawing triangles, we're drawing a wireframe version. So we're just going to draw the outline of the triangle. So we're going to start from the point A, go to point B, go to from point B to C, and then from C to A. So that's why we do it three times, this four loop three times. We get the two vertices. And so this one is J, that'll be from zero, one, two. And then this one is J plus one, so that'll be one, two, zero. And that's what this modulo three is. So it's wrapping around on the very last one. So this code here is just uh, uh, is just scaling the position of the model to be in the center rather than the bottom right corner. And then we just draw a line using it. 
and you should get something like this. Woo! And that's the, apparently that's the author's head or a scan of their head. And I believe that's chapter, that's lesson one. <laughs> so lesson two is triangles. Instead of lines, we're going to be drawing triangles. But we're going to start with doing a very classic style of uh, triangle rendering. And it is not obvious, but I think it's very simple when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, because there's almost no math beyond basic algebra, the first version of triangle drawing. The second version, we're going to be going into linear algebra land, and it's going to be a good time. So the algorithm is the line sweep algorithm. We sort the vertices. We take a triangle. We sort the vertices by their y coordinate. So each vertex will have listed by which one's the higher and lower. You could do it from bottom up, top down, doesn't really matter. The point is, is that we just know which ones are which. And so the line sleep sweep algorithm works by taking each, li each line segment and then each line segment. We're taking the, the sides of the triangle and then drawing lines in between them in almost a kind of, um, almost kind of like weaving in a sense, because you, you have your boundaries and then you just start from one boundary and go to the other. You start from one boundary and go to the other. But we're not weaving a tapestry. We're just drawing pixels on an imaginary 2D plane that happens to be stored in a 2D array that we can then print out and look at later. Okay, so uh, that's the general gist of the algorithm. So what we have here is a line representation of it. So a triangle sweep algorithm will draw the entire triangle, but we want to look at right now is just the um, major, major, the, the two boundaries. So the thing to note is that we found the, um, if you look at the picture at the bottom, the red line is connecting the highest y value vertice the high the vertice with the highest y value to the vertice with the lowest y value which means that if you were to go either left or right on that triangle you would hit the other one of the other two. if you went left or right on that line you would at some point hit the other boundary of it so on the left here we have it would be going to the right um, this middle triangle we would be going from the red line to the right again, but on this one, we can see that the line actually goes from right to the left. And because that's this is the highest and this is the lowest vertice in this triangle. Um, the way we're gonna find the highest and lowest is just using good old bubble sort because there's only three value, there's only three elements in it. So we just swap the triangles uh, or swap the vertices. And so T0 will be our highest one, T1 will be our middle, and our T2 will be our lowest one. And for this rendering, we're just draw we're using the previous algorithm to draw lines to, to uh, visualize it. But in this image, it's clear in our mental in our mind how we would draw it. We would just start drawing from the red line and going to the green line across, just sweeping left to right or right to left if we we're in the case in that case. The problem is we're actually sweeping between one line and then two lines. And it's a lot more simple if you're drawing from one line to another line, because then you're just doing a flood fill effectively, where you just, or not a flood fill in the 2D sense, but in a 1D sense, where you start at one point and you keep going until you hit the end point. If there's two end po possible endpoints, because a line segment continues infinitely, they would cross at some point. That's, that's really confusing. So what we want to do is we want to split that up into two triangles. Um, so if you look at this previous image and then look at the this image, you'll notice that the red segments are all cut in half, but the green segments are the original segment entirely. Um, the reason they're dotted is because we're drawing from left to right. We're not drawing along the edge. So the fact that it will be the endpoints don't form a perfect line is fine because 
when we draw, when we sweep across the image, will fill in all those gaps. So it's a big, big blob of code right here, but we first sort the vertices so we know which one is the top, middle, and bottom. And then we draw two, we do two line sweeps for the first triangle and then the one for the second triangle. Um, so the total height here is going to be the delta of the y values. So from the bottom to the top or top to the bottom, whichever, whichever have you. Um, and our segment height is going to be T1 or T0 or T1 minus T0. So the delta between the middle, the top two vertices. And then for our for loop here, it'll be the, the bottom two vertices so from T2 to T1. And so alpha and our beta, we do, it, we do very, a very similar thing for the very first algorithm where we use a linear interpolation. And that's because we have to know from the, top, the, the, two, the two line segments, we have to know how far along those line segments we are, and then we get to fill across it. And so this will be the filling thing where we just start from our interpolated point on one line, and then we continue iterating until we hit the boundary point on the other line. Um, and you notice here that it'll cast int, but that's just because programming languages are conv convoluted and we can actually, that's not a real big deal um, as, as far as the algorithm is concerned. So now that, yeah. This al the algorithm produces this output. Notice there's no a no aliasing because we're drawing perfect line sweeps. We'd have to like do some sort of math to figure out should I draw a partial value or some other thing. But for a primitive graphics of the 1960s and 70s, this was really good because it was very simple and it could be made it could be made fast on the hardware of the day. And this is the the um, this is very much, this is be, this kind of algorithm is something you could teach to kids because uh, this is a tangent, but um, the algorithm is one person drawing pixels individually. It's very easy to map out because you're, you could imagine someone instructing someone to draw, you know, lines directly or draw lines across this way or draw dots or whatever. Um, however, it's not the most fun way to handle triangle drawing. The more fun way is to do it with fancy math called linear algebra. So I just, this slide literally just repeats what I was about to say, but it adds that it'd be nice if instead of drawing it, drawing each triangle individually, we just thought about it as, okay, I am a pixel. This is the triangle we are currently drawing. Am I, do I belong in that pixel? First thing you can do is you can bound the, the question to, are to only the pixels within the region, in the bounding box around the triangle. A bounding box is simply the um, smallest square you could put around the 2D shape. For a triangle, it'd have the, the points would hit all the edges and you'd get a box around it. But anyways, if you only look at the, the bounding boxes so we don't have to look at the entire screen, we only look at the pixels nearby the triangle. But once we have that bounding box, we just iterate through it. This would be like a double for loop with an I and a J value. Um, and then per pixel we check, hey, am I inside the triangle? Yes, no. And if you are, you draw yourself. And if you aren't, you just, you continue to the next pixel. So here's some pseudocode for it. We take, a, uh, we take three points, these are our three vertices. We get the bounding box, like I was mentioning. We just iterate through the bounding box, all the pixels in the bounding box, and ev for every pixel we check if it's inside or not. To the issue with this is first we have to find the bounding box, which thankfully is pretty straightforward, but checking to see if we're inside these three points is the harder part. Um, and to do that, we need barycentric coordinates. Um, in a previous meetup, we talked about barycentric coordinates, um, but this will be a refresher slash rehasher because uh, I wasn't actually that confident in my knowledge of a barycentric coordinate. The definition of a barycentric coordinate 
is a point in space which is defined by a set of other points in space. In a 2D plane, that'd be a triangle, so you'd have the three corners of a triangle. A barycentric coordinate would be the position of that point relative to the triangle. If you were in, I don't know, 3D space, you'd probably use a tetrahedron and you can come up with fancy high dimensional things for higher dimensions. But we're doing 2D, so we don't need any of that. So a more mathematical formulation of it would be this image, which uh, Scratch Pixel has a great article on barycentric coordinates. If you want way more information than these three or four slides has, I highly recommend it. The thing to note is that the point P is defined by the a, court, the a point, the B point, and the C point multiplied by a W, U, and V. But we don't need to use all three vector values here. We can actually define the W in terms of the U and V. And that simplifies the problem because then we only have two vectors, not three. And we'll see why that's important. So, the re and so that's what we're defining is we're defining the point P to be um, UB plus VC plus A times the inverse of those other two, where one minus u minus v. And we can reformulate it using um, the directions. So instead of being a point, we're going to be defining, we're going to start with point A. So there'll be an arbitrary 3D coordinate or a vector. No, not a vector, a point. Sorry. Get my affine space math right. And then our B point is now defined in terms of A and the u vector from point A. And then our C point is going to be defined by our point A from a vector from A to C in the, or using V. So what we want to do now is we want to rearrange that so that P and A, oh, sorry, P and A are the same term together. Um, I'm not super hot on the math for this. But the, the gist is that we can now turn this into a linear system of equations where we have a couple of formulas we solve and then we can get some vector values out of it. And then, well, and then, and then we rearrange it into a matrix that we can multiply together. And then now that we have this matrix that we've multiplied and got some values out of it, we can figure out whether the point is inside or outside of that triangle. So we, you, so Barry, the, the, if you Google barycentric coordinates, you see the definition like here with the V vector value uh, instead of the one minus U minus V. The reason we don't want that is because when we have to solve it, we would have to solve for three values versus two. When all three values are necessary, they actually, you can define the other one in terms of the first two. And that's very useful for making it a bit faster. Um, because what we've now done is we've established that there are two, um, yeah, we, we want to get the vector UV comma, uh, UV1 which happens to be, I don't know which happens, which is defined to be orthogonal to the two basis vectors from A to B and from A to C. And so, <laughs> yes, so if we, um, yeah, I, I kind of blitz through this part now that I'm looking back on it. I'm forgetting the exact step. It goes from here's the math to here's the, the, the actual code. Um, but because I'm glossing over that, if someone wants to jump in, I'm more than welcome. <laughs> Anyways, let's actually look at some of the code. So we have our barycentric function. This takes in three vectors uh, of two two D vectors that are our three points. Yeah, it takes in three points. And it takes in our point that we want to find out whether we're inside or not of it. We get the cross product of the 
God, I should have labeled this with X and Y and Z. This is very confusing. And we take the cross product and it's this function where we have U times AB. We take the cross product, so it's actually matrix multiplication. A matrix multiplication. But it's it's similarly com complicated. Point is, is that this barycentric function gets you a coordinate that is between zero and one if it's inside the triangle, or out if it's outside of the triangle, it is not between zero and one. In fact, it's um, and this this one value here is going to be less than one because it's going to be an x coordinate, a y coordinate, and one. Um, and so, if that value is ever less than one, then we know we're not inside of the triangle. And then we can figure out the actual coordinate, which is in a UV space, which is the space inside the triangle. Um, which, yeah, it's using barycentric coordinates. This, this stuff still throws me for a loop. Anyways, so now we need to plug that function into our pseudocode we had before. We want to get a bounding box and move, bounding box minimum and maximum. These are just vec twos. So we get our, um, and we iterate through the three points and we get the smallest and the smallest and the largest x values and the y values so we can figure out okay the coordinates of the triangle are from negative two on the x-axis to positive five and vice versa on the y-axis so we know exactly how much space there is you could do the entire image but it's slower so we, we won't want to be at least a little bit fast we then go through our, we have our double for loop, which iterates through every pixel in our bounding box. Draw a little. And we check to see if that pixel is inside the triangle, which is in the bounding box. Um, if it is greater than zero, um, zero, zero, zero. Actually, uh, actually, that should be one there, but I digress. Then we set our pixel because we've established that, hey, this pixel is inside the triangle. Um, we skip over it if it isn't. So in this case, it's all less than zero. So, um, and then we have our barycentric coordinate triangle. And this is nice because the barycentrics are nice because we're not doing um, each pixel in a for loop over and over. We, we can do each pixel calculation independently. We don't have to, we don't have to, um, you know, it's, we don't have to paint the road. We have a thousand painters and we can have each one do it individually. Um, so single triangles are boring. We're going to use that wireframe model we used before, but instead of drawing lines in between all three, we're just going to take each face and then draw that face. So each face has three triangles. We feed those, those are the um, screen cords here that we've calculated from that face. Um, and then we, we, the reason we have to do that instead of just passing it raw is because we have to shift it over again because the model is established in world space and we want it to be in the middle of the screen. Um, to, to people who probably haven't done a lot of graphics, it's like, whoa, what are you doing? But in my head, it's like, oh, right, you just shift it over because, you know, zero, 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 one, and anyways. And then we get this very colorful picture because we assigned a random color to every triangle and we draw every triangle over every other one. And so the order the triangles are defined in the OBJ file is the order that you'll see them drawn. But let's get some basic basic lighting in. We're going to use Lambertian reflectance or just a coastline law. So we're going to use the difference between the direction of a light and the normal of a surface. Um, the normal of a surface is pretty easy to calculate. You have your three three um, vertices which you use to create two lines and you can do you use your right hand rule but you basically uh, uh, that's easier you have your two lines and if you do the cross product two lines two vectors if you take the cross product between the two vectors you get an orthonormal vector to those and so if you take those of the two vectors defining the edge of a triangle surface you get the normal to that surface so we take that normal and then we multiply we dot product it with the direction of the light and that's equivalent to doing the cosine and the cosine function is one when there's no difference between them and zero when there's 90 degrees difference and it's negative when it's you know on the other side 
we do that because if we want to figure out if the triangle, if the light is hitting the front of the triangle, i.e. the directions are going to be lined up, then it's going to be a positive value. And if it's negative, then that means it's on the back side, which means we can't see it. And we use that as a very crude means of doing culling. Culling. Culling? Culling? Anyways. Um, this is the code for it. It's it's more or less the same. We have our screen coordinates. We try and we'll do that. But now we take the cross product, which I had to fix this up. This is not a um, overloaded operator. This is some fancy syntax that he introduced that he didn't actually supply the cross product code for. So in my code, I have a word cross and I have a comma here and it works exactly the same. Um, the then we have to normalize it because we want our normal direction to only be between zero and one. If we had two input vectors that go from zero to 10 and zero to negative 10 or something crazy like that, our normal would be zero to 10. And when we do our dot product, that means our light strength is going to be not from zero to one, but from zero to 10. So we don't want that. Then we just do the dot product, which I believe this is an overloaded operator and I, looking at this code, I should have changed it. So the way I wrote the slides was I copied the slides code and then I put it in my editor, tried around, played with it, made it compile, and then I forgot to go back and change the code on the slides. So that's why there's these, these mistakes in there. So we have our negative, uh, I said that earlier. So if our intensity is less than zero, we do not want to draw it to keep it from being displayed. And if we do all that, we get this lovely, if not a little, concerning picture of someone's head and that's everything thank you for listening um.